Cool. Uh, let's begin. So, if you're not here for performance in Unity, you're in the wrong talk, and you should probably go to the correct talk. <laughs> so, who are we, and why should you listen to us? So, we've got Tim Dawson. Hello. Um, I did. <laughs> uh, here I am. I did not make uh, something machine. <laughs> yep. So. Tim on um, here's his Twitter details, director of Witchbeam, and he wear many hats on Assault Android Cactus, among which was making it run really fast. Um, I'm Brendan. I work at Stirfire Studios. I did not ship Assault Android Cactus. Um, <laughs> I'm the technical director at Stirfire, and um, I was the lead on Symphony of the Machine, where we had 3.75 programmers that I led, um, due to part time and other bits and pieces. So, what are we going to talk about? So we're going to talk about avoiding garbage collection inside Unity, because that's that was the single biggest problem that we had on Symphony. Um, and in that, we'll show you how to use the profiler to find and diagnose those problems, patterns that we found were problematic in Symphony, and how we resolved those patterns. There's going to be more than I'm going to be able to deal with in this talk. So at some point, there will be a blog post. And if you saw my Twitter account, feel free to bug me if you want info on when that comes out. Tim's going to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the basic methods of, of pooling and making sure that you're not creating more assets at runtime than you need to. Um, and also uh, using managers to, again, manage uh, creation and, and also access. And uh, just some general examples. Uh, a lot of Assault Android Cactus was clawed back one frame at a time. So uh, my part will reflect a bit of that. Yeah. So to set the scene, um, for those of you that don't know what Assault Android Cactus or Symphony of the Machine were, so Symphony of the Machine is a twin stick bullet hell shooter for the PS4. Yeah, you wanna? You just said that Symphony Machine is a twin stick shooter. Oh, sorry. Assault Android Assault Cactus. And, Assault Android Cactus. <laughs> Not a twin stick shooter. Is a, is a twin stick shooter. Uh, its technical challenge is the fact that it has a lot of, a, a higher number of entities on the screen, and that's kind of a little bit irreducible. So the fact that you have like huge swarming amounts of enemies is not something you can kind of cut down easily. So that was where a lot of its complexity came from for porting it to the PlayStation 4. So here's a trailer. Is that? Battery here. So Symphony is a VR game, which means you have extremely hard perf performance targets. You, you really can't be dropping a frame on a user in a headset because you will make them sick. Um, the core of the game is basically revolves around redirecting light beams. So here's a short gameplay trailer to give you an idea of how it works. So yeah, um, that, 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 there's a reason I mentioned that. Um, so yeah, we were hours out from certification, uh, for heading into certification on the PS4, and QA noticed that we were dropping frames, which is a hard cert fail if you actually go through it. So we cancelled our slot, which as you can imagine in terms of a production process is quite bad. Um, so yeah, we, ha we started getting frame drops and we cancelled our cert, and as I said, there's going to be a blog post about everything because there was a lot more than what I'm going to detail here. So step one is, is figuring out, like once you've got a performance problem, how do you figure out what it is? So you reach for the Unity profiler. And the profiler should work for you regardless of what platform you're on. It does work on consoles. It works mostly on mobile phones. Um, it's worth figuring out how to connect the profiler to a running instance of your game before you actually need it because the last thing you want to do is be super stressed and being, oh my god, how do I figure out, how do I connect the profiler, it's not working. Do that first. Do the, do the panicking on connecting it so that when you're panicking about release, you're only panicking about one thing. Um, the thing you're, these are, these are actually captures from Symphony's profiler. 
And uh, this is actually from the build where we started having problems. Um, version control is a wonderful thing. So what you're looking for is you'll notice there's three spikes there. Um, so those three spikes, we've got obviously got a problem because we're dropping well below 100 frames per second at those points. So we should examine each one in turn. So we took a look at the first one and you can see from that expanded portion that we're spending a lot of time in GC collect. So that's where we go, uh oh, we've got a garbage collection problem. In here, um, I didn't take a picture of the one with expanded out, but that's also a GC collect call that's happening. Here, we're waiting for vsync, and vsync could be a number of things. It could be waiting on a draw from the previous frame. It could be that you're running in editor mode and something's gone on with your headset or something and it's, and it's just waiting. Um, that's, you know, that's a whole bunch of, that's a talk about drawing performance and we seem to address that a lot, so that's kind of out of scope. We didn't actually see that particular problem occurring on the PS4 very much, it was mostly those GC collect calls. So, what is garbage collection? So, C Sharp's a managed language, we don't uh, explicitly manage our memory, but we have limited resources. We're still running on a console, it has a lot of memory, but it doesn't have unlimited memory. And we can't just keep creating objects. At some point, the runtime needs to go, what's not in use, and get rid of all the stuff that's not in use. This process is very slow. Garbage collection in general is not fast enough um, to operate inside the sort of times that game development requires. Like we've got a, you know, 11 to 16 milliseconds to render a frame if you're running at a high frame rate. Most garbage collectors are not really suitable. They can't collect on the main thread in there because the other problem is they have to stop execution to collect garbage because they can't have anything modifying memory while they're doing it. There are solutions to that, but Unity doesn't have them. Um, uh, generally, this will happen when you create something on the heap. And so we've got three different things here. The first is a vector, which is a struct. That particular call will not actually generate any garbage. It, won't not, it doesn't allocate on the heap, so you're fine. The second one and the third one will both generate uh, a heap allocation. Of particular interest is that second one, that string one. So everywhere where you've got like health equals plus health value, that's allocating a string every time you do that. Um, and that's going to eventually need to be cleaned up by the garbage collector. Um, and that's a cute little picture our artist drew of uh, the garbage collector. <laughs> so back to the profiler. So we see these spikes and we noticed that the garbage collector was basically running every five seconds. This is really bad. Um, so how do we dig into that? So if we look at the frame where the garbage gets collected, we will think that the um, runtime manager itself is a problem, right? Where the, where the GC collect call appears was inside the runtime manager. That's where the spike is. Let's go look at that. That's not the frame you need to look at. What you want to see is that, uh, what you want to see, oh, hang on. Uh, okay, so what's happened here? <sighs> Somehow I've skipped forward like five frames. Okay, GC running every five seconds. Tempting to blame. So yeah, you have to examine the frames before your GC gets called. So here, here we got the, the GC alloc, and then we examine the frames, and what we notice is that, so the runtime manager does actually leak a bunch of memory, so this is a frame about 10 frames before that GC collect gets called. And the runtime manager is leaking, I think that'll say like 20, 16 kilobytes, and then Raycast Wave Factory leaking about 25 kilobytes, and so on and so forth. So we've got a bunch of stuff that's allocating a very small amount of memory every frame, like 36 kilobytes on average. The problem with that is that it adds up really, really fast. That's 15 megabytes every five seconds. That's a lot of memory. And that's what was causing the runtime to go, oh, this, this, this particular thing needs some more memory. I don't have any more memory to hand out. I better go clean things up before I allocate another block of system memory. And that's, that's what causes it to kick in. So what you want to do with usual triage is target the worst thing first. So the, the worst overall was the Raycast emitter, like the, the Raycast Waypoint Factory, uh, which is a core part of the game. That was the thing that handled that beam of light that came out that the player manipulates. So yeah, core part of the laser system. So the Raycast Waypoint Factory update function, it calls other method methods. Um, 
you know, the, the, the update method that you have on a game object, it might call a lot of other stuff. Can we go deeper? Can we get more information about um, what it's calling? Yeah, so there's a button at the top that's gonna flip in a second, it's called the deep profiler. If you're running an editor, you will have to reload your scripts, so you can't obviously be running while you switch to deep profiler. On a uh, remotely connected platform, you can sometimes switch to deep profiler, but a lot more data gets sent to the debugger, and so consequently you may lose connection or other things may happen. So um, we can see from this capture that, the, um, that, 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 that there are functions that are calling other functions. Can we go deeper than um, can can we go deeper than that? Because you know it's too long. Like there's an 86 line function. Is it is it like 86 lines? It's not that much. But can, can the profiler give us more information? Yes, yes, it can. What it, what you can do is you can actually create your own profiler samples. So there's two calls. There's a begin sample and an end sample, and you bracket it much like you would um, an if statement. You know if statement bracket. You just bracket it inside those two calls. And that creates a complete new profiler sample. Uh, it's useful for not just tracking memory allocations, you can also use it to track anything else a profiler sample would track. So if you're worried about um, how many objects it's touching or how much milliseconds it's taking, you can use it to do that. So what did we find? We found four things that were the worst offenders. So we found four each loops to be a problem. Oh, long time users of Unity might be aware of this one. Raycast all was a problem, closures were a problem, and creating too many objects was a problem. So the four each loops. Prior to Unity 5.5, every single iteration of a for each loop will allocate an object. That object will need to be cleaned. You run through 10,000 iterations, that's 10,000 objects you create. Unity above 5.5, however, they upgraded the mono runtime. That one only allocates the iterator itself. Now, that's technically an allocation, but in most cases, that iterator is in fact a struct, which means that it's allocated on the stack, so it gets cleaned up. I've actually tested this in 2017.1.1, and 10,000 loops through a list, no allocations. So, check the profiler. <laughs> um, it's mostly fine to iterate through a loop, as far as I can see, but check the profiler if you're unsure. Um, there may be other problems with iterating through a loop, but they're not germane to memory allocation. Raycast all and all of its friend functions. So physics raycast all is a function you may have used <laughs> if you've got any sort of you know, point detection or lines in your game. The problem is that that function returns an array. An array is an object. That means you just allocated an object every time you raycast. So we were allocating a raycast object in the laser for every single thing we hit as we hit it. So that was a lot of array creation. This is very bad. Fortunately, at some point, I'm not sure when, Unity added a non-allocating function. Um, so that's great because it means that you, you feed it in a previously allocated array of uh, a specific size and then it will tell you how much of that array was filled, which is great. Um, the problem is, um, so say you um, say your array is passing through 10 objects and you feed it an array with five things in it, it will only fill those five objects and it will ignore the ones on the end. I don't know if the ones it ignores are deterministic either. I suspect they're not. Uh, check the documentation. Um, it also doesn't tell you if you exceeded it. So it would have been nice if they had said something like, returned negative one saying you didn't have enough indices in your array so you can give us a bigger one later. Um, perhaps they will add this feature in future. There are a lot of other non-allocating functions. So if you're doing anything in Unity that returns an array, that you're, especially if you're doing it in an inner loop or an update loop, check the docs, see if there's a non-alloc version and use it. That'll, that'll save you a lot, of, um, a lot of time. Closures. So what's a closure? Because I didn't really have a good definition of this in my own head until I did this talk. Um, so a closure is a anonymous function that captures a variable from outside that function. So you'll notice I've highlighted i go and then in my function go i. So because the variable i, which is declared outside that anonymous function, is used inside it, it will have to be saved somewhere and it gets saved on the heap. 
That function is a lambda and it is fine because it does not touch i. So these ones are completely fine and they don't allocate. And I've tested this and definitely doesn't, it's, it's fine. So we fixed this by doing some really, really evil things. So we just outright banned inline methods because it's super easy with an inline anonymous to accidentally reference a variable that's outside that, that block. So we basically had to, we, I made everyone, and as a lead I get to do this, I just said, no one is allowed to use anonymous lambdas, everyone must declare actual explicit methods for everything, which worked. The problem then is transferring state. So what we did, which was really dodgy, is we transferred the state as instances on the classes that the methods were called on, which worked fine in our case because all of our execution was synchronous. So we knew that the state would not get mutated by the time that method got called. However, you will notice in most of the Unity, um, like the event, event execute that I showed you in the previous example, you can feed it an object that will eventually get passed through to your anonymous function. And that really is what you should be doing. Um, however, that will result you in creating new objects, but there's ways around that. Collections can also be a problem. So if you don't recreate a dictionary, a set or a list, if you've got a list and it's got a hundred things in it and you now need to you know, reset that list to zero because you want to fill it again, don't do new list, do my list instance clear because that will keep the room that's in the list and it will not it will not need to reallocate all of those spaces anymore. So allocations will still occur. So say the first time you use that list, you use five spaces um, and you allocate it with a capacity of five. The next time you go and use that list after clearing, you use six spaces, it will grow to 10, but you'll be fine again until you get beyond 10. So the best idea would be to, you know, pre-allocate all of them, but if you can't, you can't. Um, you can have a list or a collection of value types which is fine until you need to do contains value type because what it will actually need to do is box that value type and that has just created a list, that's just created a new instance of an object. But you can get around that by using I equate, by implementing I equatable on your struct, by implementing equals and get hash code on your struct and by implementing the actual equals override operators, which you're all doing on your structs, right? Like everyone's doing that just as a matter of course. Finally, pooling. Um, so if you're creating event state that you need to transfer between you know, your anonymous functions or other, other things, obviously you're gonna be creating a whole bunch of objects that get passed around. You create an event state object, which gets passed around, and then once that event is finished processing, you drop that on the floor. Don't do that. You wanna pull them. So you need to have like some sort of manager um, that you have a queue in of unused objects. And so when you need a new event, data object, you go to your manager and say, hey, I need a new one, and it goes great, and it checks its queue. If it's got um, an unused one, it can hand you that one and reset it. If it doesn't have one, then it can allocate, but that's okay. We're not, we're not about not allocating anything we don't need to within reason. What we wanna do is stop allocating things that we are just then dropping on the floor. If we reuse things, that's great. Um, so yeah, you only declare new ones when the queue's empty. And if you know, if you know a priori, like you know because of your build process or because of the level design, how many uh, of an event or how many of a particular object you're gonna use, if you declare the maximum number, bef like in, in the awake or in your, in your boot up sequence of your game, then you're never doing an allocation at runtime, which, is, which means you're, you're faster because you're not, you're the, the, um, the C sharp runtime isn't looking around to try and find memory to hand you. It, you've already done it and it's already cleaned up. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so yeah, you'll eventually reach a steady state. So there's some also some other things to do with pooling that Tim will talk about now. <laughs> yeah, so um, in, in, in our game's case, a lot of, a lot of uh, performance problems was caused by uh, entity, entity interaction, entity running, and uh, obviously instantiating in runtime was a known no-no, but um, the, there's a few different ways to approach that, like the simplest, sim simplest way is to have a dynamic pooling system so that you, or a, a kind of loosely uh, predictive pooling system where you create a bunch of objects perhaps on um, wave start. But uh, in our case, because our levels are actually deterministic in terms of enemy spawning, we're able to go through and pre-calculate all of the 
uh, all of the enemies and all of their subtypes. We have, we have uh, enemy types that can burst into other subtypes, which means that if you have 10 enemies that can turn into 10 wasps each in a wave, you have to kind of, it's not trivial to figure out how many wasps you could conceivably end up having in a stage. Um, but at first we kind of did that naively. When we got up to PS4, we had a huge amount, a huge amount of instantiated enemies that were um, just waiting in the wings to be used. We was, that was fine on PC. Uh, and it was fine until we got to a level which was basically uh, our infinity drive, which was a, a long play level. It's supposed to be played for half an hour or more. Suddenly, performance was chugging on PS4, and we were kind of back in not a great spot. And so we end up having a, another big win from pre-calculating precisely the number of enemies used in the entire potential wave. Um, and just having that n lower number of uh, enemies was a huge performance win back that was pr fairly, easy to simple, uh, fairly easy to implement. Uh, the other nice thing about doing pooling with, uh, when you understand your own game design is that you can um, incorporate it with managers very well uh, because obviously something has to pool the enemies, but rather than just being a generic pooling system, you can have a manager that is smart and understands why the enemies are created and also contains nice, easily accessible lists and functions to get at them, um, which nicely ties into managers. Um, so obviously a manager is not a complicated kind of concept, it's just an object that manages, manages other objects. Um, and at first we had like a lot of loose enemies and we'd kind of collect them as we went. But, but as we were developing it became, an, uh, and as performance became a much bigger part of the game, it became obvious that we needed managers that were increasingly more sophisticated so that they could talk to each other properly. So. When you say, hey, am I, am I near a bunch of objects? You have a quick way of like zeroing down on are you close to those objects? Can you rule out a whole bunch of other ones? And they ended up being areas where we got a lot of uh, late project gain on consoles because they're the, they're the areas you can kind of really dig into and find some code that you can uh, get a few frames back or do a, do a box test to save you having to do a, a range test. And that suddenly, when you're multiplying against like 200 objects, it suddenly Saves, saves, a, saves a millisecond or so. Um, it also allows the, uh, it's kind of one of those frustrating things about uh, using the profiler is when you dig down and try to discover where your time's gone and it turns out it's gone nowhere. Like, <laughs> and then you go, hang on a moment, and you literally add up the milliseconds and you realize the numbers don't match. You've got like, it's, oh, uh, was it, uh, Unity behaviors are taking you know, uh, eight milliseconds, and you've got three and a half milliseconds at best of actually accounted for stuff, and you have overhead from different overhead. systems, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of one of the ones that that often gets brought up in Unity talks is uh, update and fixed update, and any any reflective me uh, reflection method, but um, can and it's generally not a problem. But when you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of ob objects, it's uh, it can be an easy performance hit to switch to a manager calling updates instead, uh, or even inlining um, certain behavior if you don't even need to call behaviors on the object. And managers help you do that. The final thing for, <laughs> for time slicing is it also makes it really easy. Uh, we didn't use this very much, but there was a couple of key systems which are really heavy uh, where it made sense to only run uh, certain functions every alternate frame. And uh, without a manager, obviously, you can't uh, reliably or deterministically ensure that every object gets called once per X frames, because otherwise you need something to be authoritative. So after reflecting, uh, refactoring the laser system in Symphony, we went back and did more profiling. Um, so with those changes that I listed, um, and basically just those changes that I listed, we went from leaking 24.9 kilobytes of frame to nothing. We also refactored the laser system at the same time. It was an old system in the game and we took the opportunity to make it much more cleaner and we got it updating from once every couple of frames to every single frame. So not only did it leak less, it was faster and the user got better performance out of the actual laser in the game, which was really good. After refactoring a major, major system, you should definitely profile again before immediately moving on to the thing you identified as the second biggest problem. The reason for that is that you probably touched more, like if you're super strict and you just touched the one thing, great, then you know what's going on. 
I don't know how many of you are that disciplined, especially if you're like at the end of a project and you can tend to touch other stuff. So check it again and triage and then go from there rather than just diving into something else. Um, yeah, so um, the results in Symfony, we, we found similar issues to the ones I've listed in other systems. We went through and fixed those in a triage manner um, and that started to get us up. The biggest one we found everywhere was closure capture. That, because we used a lot of event systems and stuff to do distributed messaging in the, in the game. Um, so that was really bad. The next biggest problem was pooling object reuse. If you don't go into a game thinking about pooling, you probably don't do it. Pooling's really, really huge for not just the memory allocation region, but also using managers and, and updates and not allocating game objects where you don't need them because they're quite expensive to create. So we went in and fixed them all. And GC Collect in the shipping version of the game, it still happens, but it happens on average about every five minutes. It happens much, much less often. And it has essentially resulted in us not dropping any frames, which was really important because we passed cert. So the game's on the store. Yay! <laughs> so other things in order of irritation that we found. String manipulation. For us, it wasn't that much of a problem, but if you have UI in your game anywhere with text in it, yeah, look at that. String builders will help, but yeah, it's still a big problem. Um, coroutines. Coroutines leak. If you don't do a yield return null on a coroutine in Unity, you just leaked an object. So if you wait for seconds, you just leaked an object. We pulled out almost all of the coroutines in Symphony of the Machine. Uh, which caused our programmers much pain. <laughs> get component will leak when it returns null. You should probably not be get componenting in an update loop or an inner loop anyway, but if it cannot find the object, it will return null. I haven't tested this in 17.1, but it was still a problem in 5.5. Um, boxing and unboxing of value types can be another gotcha. It's, a, it's kind of a hidden one. And finally, variadic functions. So that's a function that takes an array argument. String format is the obvious one here. Because it requires an array to pass those variables around, it will allocate an array and that array will get leaked. There were more. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so again, with uh, a lot, uh, so many of uh, Cactus's battles revolved around entity counts and, um, and having things that would just we had a lot of things on screen because they were supposed to be on screen. Um, so, <laughs> which, which made it difficult to optimize without reducing the game, which was a no-go. No uh, we had a particular boss fight called uh, Vespula who controls 150 wasps moving around. And so that became a constant point of, uh, it, was, it was a constant hotspot in terms of performance and also meant that it was a constant focus of trying to find what was running slowly because any small gains would be multiplied very quickly. Um, and that's like a lot of our performance actually came out of that. We'd, we'd analyze our worst case and figure out, oh, this is running, you know, this is running slowly because it's running this many times, but then that logic ends up iterating across the game because once you realize that something's better than something else, you just start doing it during overhauls. Um, and so the last win we had going into a console submission uh, the last significant win with the wasps, we, uh, I had already replaced a physics overlap sphere check with um, a simplified uh, position check in a, in a loop that tested wasps against wasps. So it wasn't 150 times 150, that would actually, that was, we rationed it, but it was still fairly heavy. And um, someone spotted that the, uh, how was it, we, during the during one of the deep uh, deep for uh, for uh, for loops, we were actually assigning a script to a variable to check it, and so it was a it was an it was a for loop. So we didn't need to assign it to a variable. We could just check the script directly. It was right there, and that change just from removing that one allocation actually got us back like a frame on a console, which was like huge for the like level of triviality it was, but it kind of yeah. Um, we uh, one of the one of the other ones. I mean, uh, working with Unity systems is a bit scary because obviously they kind of cost what they cost, and you can't really dive too much into them. But you can you can work with them rather than against them. And um, I had a level. The actually I think you may have seen it on the video. It was a turning level with the large um, 
large pieces, and that's turning physics, which moving physics scary. And um, in the last minute, I went in and realized I could rebuild that so that I had the physics parts in a single component. Uh, uh, what do you call it when you when you combine rigid bodies? Um, uh, yeah, uh, composite out of primitives, rigid body. And just by reordering the way that things were parented, again, that gave a significant performance gain for like zero functionality change. It was just like I'd reduced it from five game, uh, fr five uh, rigid bodies to one composite one. And it was like, that was, you know, that's that's stuff's kind of scary because it's not like you can sit down and analyze it and see it in a profile, but it just kind of comes out of analyzing a level and going, I think there's a way that we can try things out and try the other way. Um, and the other one, this is an older example. It kind of came up much earlier in the project and we kind of got rid of it uh, when it came up, but it was uh, influx, the level where the, uh, the the ground is changing. And in a ver very early version of that, we, it was running fine on PC, but when we put it onto a lower spec hardware, uh, it was running at half the frame rate of the other levels. So obviously it became a what's going on here. And we discovered it was um, uh, the skin meshes. We were using the skin meshes. <laughs> Yeah, so this is the level, and you can see the game uh, and the whole level changes. And each of these blocks is a skin and mesh that uh, animates into the solution. And then the moment I'm going to show you, it's like, uh, no, 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 it's okay. Oh, it's in sorry. The sorry. Yeah, it's in this one? Yep. Yeah, uh, no, no, it's, it's in, it was in the same Oh, game. my bad. Yeah. That's all good. I don't think I skip, can skip it forward. I can play it again. Uh, <laughs> large meshes. And so this ended up running very nicely on all the hardware that we launched it on. Uh, and this is just a slow-mo slow version, because slow-mo is great. Sorry, there should be uh, classical music playing. But I love optimizations like this, because they, you know, once they go in, they, they look exactly like the game used to, but runs a whole lot better. And there it switches back to the pre-baked one. Yeah, yeah, you can see on the last frame, once the last object stops animating, it just immediately clicks into um, cache meshes. Yep. So there's some further resources that um, I recommend and Tim recommends looking at. Um, Ian Dundor and Mark Harkness are the Unity Spotlight engineers, and they give really, really good talks on optimizing things. So um, those are full of really good stuff, most of which we didn't actually, like, they haven't talked about stuff we've talked about, and they talk about other stuff. If you're having problems with your UI, uh, the 2017 one will give you lots of really good stuff. Um, so yeah, um, definitely have a look at those. And that's the end of the talk. Does anybody have any specific questions? What was your solution to getting rid of coroutines? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so remember how I said we did some ugly things to finish yeah, so we did some ugly things for coroutines as well, essentially involving storing state in the parent class that the coroutine lived in, and then using the update loop as a brute force coroutine. So it would literally check the state that it was in and then do the next thing in that update. I didn't say it was nice, I said it worked. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, navigator. Boom. Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> come on, animations. There we go. There you go. Hey. Just to follow up on that question, in, in retrospect, would you have just, like, if you return null with your coroutines, would there be no way that you could do that in all of your coroutines that would massively affect things? The coroutine itself leaks. Oh, okay. 
when you do a coroutine, start it also leaks. <laughs> I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but yeah. It, okay, so so this was happening while we were doing start. So we got into this huge siege mentality, and so there was a six week period where we basically did nothing but fix performance. Uh, don't do this in your project. Do address performance throughout your project, but that's a production talk, so it's not really here. Um, um, so we just started targeting everything, and that was another thing that got pulled out, which um, it wasn't, the, the robot had a lot of state because it's an AI and it needed to wait and do things, and that was incre incredibly problematic. If you ever, if you meet Amos Wolf, he was the lead on that particular system, and he will probably have not very nice things to say about me making him pull all the coroutines out, but it got the game across the line. Like that's what, that's why we sort of did this, is both of these games had particularly gnarly performance problems inside an engine that is quite famed for not being able to cut the mustard. And you can get it there, it just requires work. Mm. Anybody else? Oh, yep. Um, you've got your garbage collections to be about five minutes apart. Um, it's still kind of sad that it happens at all. And um, I guess I was wondering, in your opinion or perhaps in Sony's opinion, what's the minimum time that you would it depends on your performance target. It's, it's, that's not a thing that you can say without knowing what your game is. In VR, you really want to try and design things so that it never happens, okay? Like if, if I had known, if I'd known what I knew now going in, I would have concentrated on it a lot more and we probably wouldn't have had any allocations. It basically got to the point at which we stopped getting the cert fail problem and we just, we just went, okay, we've, we've done enough, now let's move on to other bugs that we have to fix. Um, which I guess is always the case. We never have enough time to finish everything we'd like to. And was that five minutes? Was it threshold? Or was it it, so once we finished the last set of things in the robot itself, that's where it got to. And before the robot, we were, we were, not, we were not fast enough. And then after we were, so at that point we kind of went, okay, we've done enough. Um, but yeah, we, we only stopped as we crossed the threshold. Like we, we definitely kept retesting it which was annoying for QA because they kept having, because the other part is of course, this doesn't happen until the game has got a lot of things happening. So they had to play like 20 minutes, 30 minutes into the game. So each test run took a long time. They got very, very fast at playing the game, but yeah. Um, yep. With the gameplay that you just showed with the Assault Android, Ben, mm -hmm. um, when you create, when you do the transitions, I presume you create a bunch of objects. Um, did, was that like a pool thing where you have a bunch of uh, objects and then you disable them all? They're all create. I mean, they're all they're all ex yeah. They're created on level, begin. <laughs> so they're already there, um, and then they're just turning on and off visual meshes that are associated with them. So uh, in that case, there's just uh, 144 prefabs that are in, in the level from the beginning. So there's no allocation there. There's just uh, some meshes turning on and off. So do you have like uh, a set of a pool for the combined meshes and a pool for the other one? I don't, don't, one did you pull one? them? Or were they just there? I mean, they're, they're just they're just there basically, oh. uh, and then there's there's just another script that manages all 144 of them and yep. has lookup tables and things. And then the the meshes when it replaces them with the combined meshes, it has four pre-allocated meshes that it fills up. Yeah. So to to drill into that, um, the case there is where you can pre-allocate everything, and that's the ideal case. Like if you can pre-allocate everything when you, your game boots or on wake up or on time slice as you load the level, do that. Like deterministic performance is always, always better than some sort of like steady state thing that I was advocating. Like if you can get determinism, do it. Sometimes you can't do that. Like, so we couldn't do that with the laser is because we wanted, I, I needed to give the design, okay, I could have built a build system to fix this problem. So in <laughs> theory, I don't know. So the laser can split into different subsections because there was a splitter, right? And the player gets handed potentially up to six splitters. And so, so for each reflection, it has to allocate like a new part in the list that, it, that tracks where the laser is. And I could have gone, in a build process, I could have gone, the, la the maximum number of beams in the game at any time could possibly be blah, let's pre-allocate it for that. But I didn't add the build process to do that. Instead, I went for, well, we're not deallocating anything. And most of the time when we do an allocation, it's fine. And I'm not allocating any game objects. So let's just do that, right? So, but pre-allocating is almost always better. Um, the only case I can think of is maybe if it affects your load time. Like, that would be it. It's interesting though, like, a lot of the time you do ship with uh, stuff that you know is not optimal, but it just doesn't 
factor into the performance enough to be fix, uh, worth fixing. So it's like if you don't want to go chasing down and, and like get rid of every four if if it's not even impacting anything. Like it's <laughs> or for for each sorry. <laughs> yeah, go, go, be guided by the profiler. Like, like, um, have your targets. If you can have some sort of automated routine to check worst case hotspots, do that, and then start identifying and keep identifying those things and and hit those. Um, you know, um, when we were shipping Freedom Fall, Maya wrote a routine that took our worst case level and ran the camera across it to identify where we would drop, and and we just kept running that until she got it under. 30 frames. Were we targeting 60 or 30 of that? I can't remember. Yeah, it was Fire TV that was a problem. Anyway, yeah. So, so write a, if it's a thing that's deter that you can reproduce, write an automated system to reproduce it and then keep tracking it as you make changes. And, in, and when it gets to the point at which the game is shippable, stop. Um, because you have other things to fix. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah, so collision turns on and off on one frame, so and it's just box a uh, bunch of box colliders. So, uh, it so on the start of the transition, the physics is already swapped, and the rest of it is just visuals catching up. Don't animate physics unless you really have to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that that. Um, if you can get away with it, animate your object via vertex shader and don't touch the transforms. Anybody else? No, cool. Hopefully you got some valuable insight and if you have any further questions, let us know.